fear and money kept driving me to go every day into a job where a lot of times I was exhausted, I was stressed out. So I took a deep dive into what motivates me, what do I want? Welcome to Career Relaunch, the podcast dedicated to helping you reinvent your career. My name is Joseph Liu, and I'm here to help you gain the clarity, confidence, and courage to overcome the challenges of making changes to your career so you can do more meaningful work and truly enjoy your professional life. In each episode, I feature people who have decided to step off the beaten path to reinvent their careers and do work that matters. We talk through their unique personal stories, the challenges they overcame, and the lessons they learned along the way to help you understand what it takes to relaunch your own career. Today, my guest is going to discuss how she relaunched her career from being a legal secretary to a yoga studio founder. We'll discuss the downside of having a job that's too comfortable and what you learn about yourself when you're forced to make a sudden career pivot. Afterwards, during today's Mental Fuel, I'll talk about how career transitions can and often do take longer than you expect. Today, I'm speaking with Lola Scarborough, a certified yoga teacher and managing director and co-owner of Yoga Lola Studios. She's also a certified wellness and health restoration natural foods consultant, a certified tonic herbalist, and a certified aerobics teacher. She now runs her own yoga studio after a long history as a writer, teacher, and project manager in the corporate world. She also published her first book in July 2018. Now, I was eager to feature Lola on the show because she's got a real honest story about how she went from spending 20 years as a legal secretary to starting her own yoga studio, being very transparent about how lonely and challenging the journey was at times, but also about how believing in herself is what ultimately allowed her to eventually get her yoga studio off the ground. We're going to talk about the challenges of leaving a stable job behind and some of the things you're forced to confront about yourself when making an uncomfortable career change. She also made her first career pivot at the age of 48, then another at the age of 59. So I hope that can be a good reminder to you that it's never too late to move your career in a new direction. You can get all the show notes from today's episode at careerrelaunch.net slash 67. Lola spoke with me from League City, Texas. Good morning, Lola, and welcome to Career Relaunch. It is great to have you on the show. Thank you, Joseph. I'm delighted to be here. All right. Well, we are going to talk about a few different things today, including your former life before you started your yoga studio, your transition, and also how you've now become a yoga instructor. I'd like to start by having you, first of all, just tell me what you've been focused on right now in your career and your life. Well, I've continued to stay focused on building my yoga studio and wellness business. But most recently, I released a book and I'm going to be featured in an upcoming book as well called The World's Most Amazing Women that's going to be released in December. And one of the things I'm doing now is working to grow out my speaking skills I love to lecture. I love a captive audience. It's my very favorite thing. I've been working on that and working on raising awareness around different health-related issues through doing blogging and other things like that. Well, I know that we've got a couple different topics to talk about today, and I want to come back to your studio. I do want to go back in time and talk about what you were up to before you were a yoga instructor, because I know you haven't always been a yoga instructor. Before we get to that, how did you get discovered to be featured in that book, The World's Most Amazing Women? I started doing some podcast radio interviews with Casey Armstrong, and he invited nine women that he felt had stories that were significant meaningful and life-changing for his readers. So he invited me to be one of the lead writers in his book. Okay. Well, very cool. I'm looking forward to seeing you featured there. Can we go back in time, Lola, and talk about what you were up to before you were involved with yoga? What were you doing in your former life when you were working in the corporate world? And let's start from the beginning and then we can move forward from there. Well, when I was 17 years old, I graduated from the Atlanta College of Medical, Dental, and Business, and I spent roughly 20 years of my career as a legal secretary, and I loved it. I loved the legal field and actually thought about entering it, but then decided to have children instead. 
as a part of that, towards the latter end of my career, we made a huge transition. I'm 59, so I've seen software come of age from MS-DOS to MS-Word. And because I picked up on those sorts of things easily, I became a lead trainer and then became a lead writer for our training materials. So I did that for quite a long time, and I loved doing that too. And from there, I segued over into becoming a full-time technical writer. I worked with Capgemini, Exxon, a software company called SBPA Systems. I did that for, I guess, another 15 years. And from there, I went into project management. That was my last role in the business world, where I led project teams of up to 10 and 15 people. I worked with companies as big as Burger King and Vanguard and some others and doing software implementations for their administrative systems. That's where I was when my career shifted. Okay. So now you've already mentioned a couple career shifts, and I know we want to cover the major one shifting toward being a yoga instructor. I do want to go back a little bit here because you've mentioned a couple major shifts from being a legal secretary to a technical writer and then a technical writer to a project manager. Let's just take the latter most recent transition from being a technical writer to a project manager. How did you manage to make that sort of a transition? Because at least on the surface, it seems like those would be two very different things. They really were. And I wasn't really fully prepared (laughs) for what happens when you're a project manager. But I met a man and I married him and I moved from where I was. I moved myself and my children from Stafford, Texas to League City, Texas, which is where I'm at now. And I went in and I interviewed and she really liked my style because I'd held lead positions as a technical writer. I managed teams. So I was already used to being in leadership positions. But yeah, being a project manager, I tell, I'd put out my begging bowl before I do that again. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what did you dislike about being a project All manager? the 22 hour days and uh, implementations not going right clients very understandably, being very distressed because their systems were down and people would quit because it was such a stressful situation. Then you'd find yourself with a deficit of personnel. It was a small company. So one person leaving would have a major impact on the ability to get the project to fruition. I mean, the pay was awesome, but it was a lot of stress. And can you take me to the moment when you made the decision to leave that behind? What was happening for you at that time? I'm a very security-oriented person, and I always told people, they'd say, well, don't you want to start your own business? I'm like, no, not until after I retire. So I kind of got kicked out. I had opened my yoga studio. We had uh, Ike come through, and we were in the acute stage of a recession in this area. And that was in 2008. Is that Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I had a friend who was coming. I let her use my yoga studio, which by the way, only had one student because the yoga studio was to be a retirement dream. I would only really be working at hard six years from now had things gone along as I intended. So I had opened it up and she had a magazine She said, well, if you let me use your studio for my group, I'll run a free ad for you. I said, awesome. Before I even opened the studio and put a web presence out, I talked to my manager and I talked to the other co-owner of the business. I said, listen, this is what I'm doing. This is really just a place on paper. It's a retirement dream. We're going to be working on it for years. Is it okay if I do this? And they said, yes. And I had not spoken to the big boss about it because she knew that I did yoga. I taught yoga after business hours to some of the students there. Anyhow, she saw this ad and she was livid. And she told me, she said, you have to make a choice. I said, well, what are you talking about? She said, you have to make a choice. You either give up your yoga studio or you quit your job. I said, well, first of all, I'm not going to quit. You're going to have to fire me. And secondly, it's not even really a yoga studio. We have two classes a week. I have one student. She said, no. It became a matter of principle for her. She said, no. And I said, 
okay, well, I'll wait for you to fire me. And so she obliged me by firing me. That's how Yoga Lola kind of got catapulted into being. And I started looking for jobs, couldn't find anything. I'm highly educated. I have incredible business experience, but there was a recession. I realized that I wasn't going to find anything. And what I had to do was that saying, when God gives you lemons, make lemonade. So that's how it happened. Now, I know that this does come up for people who listen to this show where they've got a side interest and a side project, which could be anything from just a casual hobby to something a little bit more serious. It sounds like this was just at the infancy stage and something that you were tinkering with, didn't plan to launch it until many years later. And yet your employer took issue with the fact that you had this side gig. What was her major concern? She said that Imagitech needed 150% of my time. I said, well, it has it. I look, go on the web, look at my schedule. There are two classes. My husband can take them. We only have one student. And she said, well, you're going to try to grow your business on my back. I said, well, no, I'm not. I'm not going to try to grow my business at all for a long time. It's just kind of there as a placeholder in my life because I made a lot of money. It was really a sweet deal even with all the stress. And, you know, I got to wear beautiful suits. I got to travel. I had an expense account, but she told me I had to make a choice. And I was like, well, we just spent $250,000 on a building. I don't know what you expect me to do with it is, you know, so anyhow, in the end, it worked out for the best. But if you had asked me at the time, I really thought what was going to happen was she was going to fire me. And then I was going to go find another job, just like the one I had. That is not what happened. So during that immediate aftermath of you moving on from that company, what did you start to do the next week, the next month to figure out what you wanted to do next and how you wanted the next chapter to look in your life? So I kept looking, you know, and I started working on the studio more because I had free time on my hands. But then I finally realized I wasn't going to find another job and I had to re-educate myself and it was the studio or bust. And that took about nine months to sink in and I was shell-shocked initially. So let's shift gears, Lola, and talk a little bit about the yoga studio and how you got it from where it was to where it is right now. Because I think The idea of starting a yoga studio, when I hear that, that seems pretty cool. And I think that there's probably a lot of people out there who think, oh, it'd be so cool to start my own studio, whether it's yoga or fitness or whatever it is. How did you get that thing off the ground going from one student to more students? I'd love to hear some details on what exactly you did. Absolute persistence and a dogged refusal to give up. And I had to re-educate myself. I was a certified yoga teacher and I'd been teaching yoga for a while before we opened the studio. And I was also an energy healer. My grandmother taught me that at the age of 12. And I had my business skills. I don't know how anyone could open any business, whether it's a yoga studio or any kind of small business without having the kind of business skills I had, because that really became the foundation from which I built. Because I knew, you know, you have to be competitive in the marketplace. You have to have the right education for the audience that you're presenting yourself to. So I got a two-year degree in Ayurveda, which means something in the wellness business. I also became an ERYT 500. So I went to the highest level of yoga training that you could have. I rolled in my business skills as a technical writer by creating training programs that are really the bread and butter of our studio. So we have a 200-hour training course. And then I also have a training course where I teach people how to do hands-on healing and I certify them. I went to the Spencer Institute. I got my life coaching degree. I got some aerobics degrees. I studied Chinese herbals. So I remade myself in a brand new image. Then I learned how to do marketing, which was really painful for me because I'm not very good at, quote, selling things. I'm really uncomfortable with that. What was uncomfortable about that for you? I feel like, you know, when you try to sell something, 
inherently you cheapen yourself. That was kind of the attitude I had then. I've made a lot of shifts in my attitude since then. And I've gone from the idea that I am selling something to the idea that I am offering something that if people like, they'll buy. And there's no shame in that. But it was a big transition. The only thing I'd ever had to market was myself and my skills in the business world. I didn't really have to quote, sell myself more than once, they hired me. And then I began to show them what I could do. But that's different than selling. Yeah, definitely. I've, as you know, since we've spoken before recording this, I also came from the corporate world and I was a full-time employee before launching my own business. And I definitely hear what you're saying about feeling a little bit more exposed and having to almost be forced to sell yourself more regularly versus being hired into a job. And then you do have your annual reviews, but if you do a good job, you're pretty well set in general. So yeah, that's very interesting. Any other surprises that have come up along the way for you in building your studio? Yes. The first surprise was that I lived in an area where people were relatively hostile (laughs) to yoga. They felt like it was something that went against their belief system. They were very fearful of it. So it took years and years and years of educating people. And, you know, the media now, you see yoga everywhere. But when we first opened the studio, especially here in Texas, which is very conservative, which is very traditional, which is very, very Republican, very Christian. There was a lot of fear initially about the technology of yoga. And it took a long time for the message to get out that yoga is actually a technology. It's a tool that works with the human body, mind, and spirit. Whether you are agnostic, atheist, or deeply religious, learning to even how to speak that to people was an education of its own because I had done yoga for so long and I was so open-minded and I had junketed it around in the world of these things for such a long time. I really did not realize that one of the biggest barriers to entry at the time was belief systems. Yeah. I hadn't thought about that aspect of yoga. I always kind of assumed that people did it for the health benefits, but I guess there is that spiritual side to it, which is either appealing or maybe quite alienating to people who aren't familiar with it. Do you feel like there were any misconceptions about being a yoga instructor or misconceptions about yoga instructors in general that you would like to straighten out? Not that I have encountered in my one-on-one interactions, but I think sometimes people think, you know, yoga instructors are really limber and they can do, you know, what you see on the yoga journal. (laughs) I'll tell you, that's about 10%, right? (laughs) Right. (laughs) Yeah. Most yoga instructors are just people who have injuries, who bump up against their own internal conflicts, who, you know, have lives like regular people. It looks glam, but it's not all that glam. It really isn't. And how long did it take for you to get the studio from a place where you weren't sure it was going to be sustainable to a place where you felt like, okay, this is something that could become my full-time vocation? Seven years. Wow. Okay. And was that longer than you expected, shorter than you expected? Well, like I said, I had a hard landing into it. And so I didn't really know what to expect. Because it was something that was going to happen way in the future, I'd not done markets, you know, because we figured by the time we were ready to do it, the environment would be a lot more ripe for it than it was at the time we bought the studio. So we started, like I said, we had one student and a big yoga class three years later was, wow, man, we had five students. That's awesome. But I would wake up every day and I'd tell my husband, I'd say, I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to be able to get this thing off the ground. And we'd look at it and we'd say, okay, we're going to try one more day. So we went to the one more day (laughs) kind of model and we just took it one day at a time. But we stuck it out and our reputation is beautiful. I mean, we have such a wonderful reputation in our community. 
and people began to talk about us. And then I learned how to do things on Facebook. I grew our social media presence. I learned how to language what I was saying to people in a way that they could embrace it. I began to really understand what the deeper fears were. I guess in the last year, we've had maybe 800, 900 people in and out of our studio. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So we've gone from nothing to something and it's just been incredible. Yeah. One of the things that I think people who might be listening to this show struggle with is that time gap between when you start something and when it quote unquote takes off. And so you're talking about seven years here. How did you know that you wanted to keep going with it versus quitting and moving on to something else. In other words, the question is around, do I keep persisting or do I cut my losses and move on to something else? For me, I look at it and I say, okay, how much has it grown this year compared to last year? How much more interest is there? You know, and looking at income, I mean, it's grown exponentially, even though our income is still, I mean, I think most people would find it to be in the small to medium range. It's enough to cover the cost of the studio and to allow us to keep growing. And our studio, because we purchased it, we have an asset that every time we pay the mortgage, we're actually building equity in a hard asset that should we decide, okay, we're not going to do this anymore, we can let it go. But in addition to that, there are the emotional benefits, which are significant. I really did not get those kinds of emotional benefits in the corporate world. You know, I had pride, I had success, you know, I had those feelings in the corporate world of, wow, we got this project done. It's awesome. I have people who come into me who are going through very traumatic events in their lives, cancer, divorce, all kinds of other traumatic events. And they come to me and when they do, and we first start working together, their lives have been blown apart. And by the time we get finished working together, I see a transformation that is unbelievable. In my group classes, people come in and they sit down. They can't even bend forward. They're so stiff. A year later, the transformation, they can reach their toes. So the emotional reward of watching that happen is really what's kept me in the game. Gotcha. Well, that's a great segue, Lola, into one of the last things I was hoping to talk with you about before we wrap up with what you're focused on and the book that you just released last year, which is some of the things that you've learned along the way here. And you mentioned emotional benefit for you. What other benefits have you seen in your life having made this shift into doing work that you find more meaningful? It woke me up and I didn't even realize I'd gone to sleep because like I said, it was a hard landing. I was like, boom, wow, look at how security oriented I am. Look at how much fear has kept driving me to go into something. Fear and money kept driving me to go every day into a job where a lot of times I was exhausted. I was stressed out. I had sciatica. My lower back hurt all the time. So, I took a deep dive into what motivates me. What do I want? I had stopped asking myself what I wanted a long time ago because I had what I needed. The other thing that was coming to mind as you were sharing your story today, Lola, is that when we first connected, you said that when you make career changes, you meet parts of yourself, both likable and unlikable, that you never knew existed I'm curious, what did you discover about yourself? And, and I'm curious about both the likable and the unlikable. Well, the likable is that I found out that my heart was bigger than I thought it was and that it had more room to encompass others because in the corporate world, you kind of shove yourself off. You don't have a lot of contact with the public. So in finding their stories, finding them moving, finding the generosity that is inherently mine and being able to share it more freely. Unlikable was that I found out that I was a very transaction-oriented kind of gal, <laughs> at least in the beginning. I mean, I had always done generous things and I'd worked in the community and 
you know, I still did lots of things by donation when I was doing my healing and, and my yoga classes while I was working. But I had to come to terms with that part of me that had a cold, hard edge that wanted to drive things to profit and make everything transactional, weighing how, you know, this person would fit into my life and how they could help me grow into what I wanted to be. And I also found out that I had a penchant for a little bit of snobbery. I didn't like being sweaty and I didn't like being in yoga clothes all the time. I didn't like my hair hanging limp. I wanted my suits back. I wanted to feel important. And for a long time, I did not because there was nobody to validate me. Yeah. Why do you think that it takes a major career change to uncover these things about yourself? And another way of asking that is why do you think these parts of ourselves remain hidden? In your case, you mentioned bigger heart, more transactional, the snobbery. What do you think it is about career changes that helps to make that stuff emerge? You are no longer safe. Yeah, I guess it forces you to uh, to face a lot of your demons. Your fears. Right. Mm-hmm. You also mentioned before we started this recording that who is really inside comes from a place of discomfort, which is what a career pivot or change forces upon you. What exactly did you mean by that? When you go into automatic pilot, for example, I call it putting on your face. You wake up in the morning, you know exactly how you're supposed to look, you know exactly how you're supposed to present yourself, you know what's going to help you get ahead. But when you're out there and you're on your own and you're creating something from scratch, you don't really even know the language. So you have to bust through. And I feel like I am so much more authentic. And it's not that I'm not afraid. You know, I worry about things. I I do. But I'm a lot more authentic than I ever used to be. And that's because nobody's going to fire me except me. Right. Well, one of the things that we also talk about on this show is clarity, confidence, and courage. And it really sounds like you found a lot of courage to stand on your own two feet and start your own studio and keep it going. How have you amassed courage during this transitional time? I allowed myself to really feel my feelings. So when I needed to just pull back and have what I call a breakdown so that I could get to the next breakthrough, I let myself have that. And I stopped pretending that I didn't have fears. I became a lot more real to other people. And I became a lot more cooperative instead of competitive. That also took some breakdowns to get to the breakthrough, which is, you know, I'm not in a corporation anymore. I'm in a community and learning to adapt to that. Well, one of the things I know you're doing for your community relates to what I wanted to wrap up with today. Can you tell me more about your book that you just released last year? The book is geared towards helping Women find underlying causes that can trigger breast cancer. And the reason I became so interested in it is because as a healer and a yoga instructor, I get a lot of women coming into me who have had breast cancer or who are going through the treatments and the surgeries. And I started noticing an alarming increase of clients coming to me who had been diagnosed with breast cancer. And so about 10 years ago, I thought, oh my God, there has to be an underlying reason for just this surge. And it's not only breast cancer, it's chronic or acute disease in particular, but breast cancer became my focus. So I got out there and I started researching all the different kinds of scientific data around breast cancer. I coupled that with my interest in complementary and alternative healing modalities, which I've been in that field for 40 years of my life, and put it together in a book. And the book is designed to help women uncover different tools that they can use to help prevent it. And that's the whole focus of the book. The name of the book is Fighting for Our Tits, A Woman's Battle Cry. That's what it's for. Well, that's really wonderful to hear that you've taken the time to write about such an important topic of breast cancer. And if people want to learn more about you or they want to check out your book or learn more about your studio, where can they go? 
I have two different websites. My writer's website is Lola Scarborough. Dot com, or they can go to yogalola.com, or they can just directly email me, lola at yogalola.com. All right. Well, thank you so much, Lola, for telling us more about your former life in the corporate world, your life as a yoga instructor, the realities of starting your own studio, and also the benefits of doing work you really enjoy. So best of luck with all of your writing and with Yoga Lola Studios. Thank you, Joseph. It was a pleasure and a privilege to be on your show. So I hope you heard some useful insights from Lola about the true realities of reinventing yourself, why self-belief is so important when making a change, and how discomfort forces you to figure out who you really are. Now it's time to wrap up with today's Mental Fuel, where I'm going to talk about how my own career transitions have all taken longer than I initially expected. Before we get to today's Mental Fuel, I'd like to thank Grammarly for supporting this episode of Career Relaunch. Built by linguists and language lovers, Grammarly's writing app finds and corrects hundreds of complex writing errors so you don't have to. And as a Career Relaunch listener, you can download Grammarly for free by going to getgrammarly.com slash relaunch. This is the part of the show called Mental Fuel, where I finish the show with a brief personal story related to one of the topics we covered today and wrap up with a simple challenge to help you move forward with your own career goals. For today's Mental Fuel, I wanted to go back to what Lola mentioned about how getting her yoga studio to a place where it felt financially sustainable took her a full seven years. And while that's not an eternity, it's certainly a solid amount of time. And I don't think anyone who decides to start your own business necessarily wants it to take seven years to gain traction. So that got me thinking about the timelines we set for ourselves with career changes and the tendency to be too aggressive and perhaps overly optimistic with the time we give ourselves to get our careers to a place where we can feel happy. And I can speak from personal experience here because with pretty much every single career change I've gone through or even any new initiative I've launched for my business, it's taken way longer than I expected to figure things out, have the breakthrough I wanted, or just gain the traction I had in mind. I'll just share a few concrete examples here. When I decided to withdraw from medical school, I remember telling my friends and family at the time that I needed just a few months on my own to sort things out. In reality, it took me a solid four years of dabbling in a lot of different areas before I identified a new career direction I could feel good about, which was ultimately brand management. When I moved from the U.S. to the U.K., although I did find a job within three months of arriving here after a lot of hustling and interviewing, even after three years, I never actually got my corporate marketing salary back up to where it was in the U.S. because marketing salaries in the U.K. are just so much lower than they are in the U.S. Later on, when I left my marketing job in the U.K. to start my own business, it took me a solid six years of hard work to get my self-employment income to exceed my former corporate marketing salary salary in the U.S. And even using this podcast as an example, I kind of had it in my head that I was going to have this big launch period within the first month where I generate most of the buzz for the show and acquire a ton of listeners. But in reality, it kind of felt like chirping crickets when I launched And it probably wasn't until 20 or 30 episodes later that I felt like this show was starting to gain the kind of traction I wanted with the listeners I had in mind. So the common pattern here is that I always seem to underestimate how long it actually takes for me to make a meaningful shift in my career. And at first, I thought that maybe had to do with my tendency to be unrealistic or overly aggressive with my timelines. But what I've learned over time is that it's not only that I'm too aggressive with my timelines, but also that it's just really hard to predict how long transitions take. And I see this same dynamic play out with the clients I work with and the people I cross paths with in my live workshops. Now, the planner in me likes to believe that if you just map things out, and stick with a consistent plan, and put in my 20-mile march, which is something we talked about all the way back in episode three when this show launched, that if I plan well enough, I can hit certain milestones within certain defined time periods. But stuff comes up. A big project comes up, or I get distracted by something else happening in my life, or a team member leaves, 
or a technical issue slows me down, or something happens with my health, or we move house, or we have a baby, or I just don't make progress as quickly as I would like, or I just get tired and need a break from the constant hustle. I know that I often put a lot of pressure on myself to cross certain milestones within a defined period of time, partly because it's my nature, partly because you kind of have to operate this way to survive in the corporate world, and partly because this idea of hustle and achievement is glamorized in the popular media. And on the one hand, pushing yourself is good because it keeps you moving forward and forces you to avoid the trap of just being content or complacent. But being unrealistic with your timelines for transitions can actually set you up for failure. Because failing to meet those timelines can lead to a lot of frustration, disappointment, and even suffering. And this can turn into a downward spiral where all this negative emotion can ultimately cause you to prematurely walk away from something that's actually still worth pursuing. So the point in telling you all this is to just gently remind you to give yourself enough time to make sure you're being realistic with the runway you've given yourself to achieve the transition, success, or traction you want. I've found that making a change, especially a career change, often takes more steps than I expect and more time than I expect before things really take off. This takes me to a quote from the author Veronica Tugaleva. There is no greater suffering than constantly measuring yourself and coming up short, except perhaps the realization that your suffering is hurting others. But where do we learn these things? Because really they are learned. We don't come crying out of the womb because of our birth weight or because we have no money in this brand new world. We learn to measure and we learn to attach our self-worth to those measurements. So my challenge to you, especially if you're someone who finds yourself always not quite achieving as much as you want, as quickly as you want, is to take a step back reevaluate whether you're being realistic with the timeline you've given yourself, and just make sure you're being reasonable with what you hope to achieve by when. Start by thinking about the timeline you've created for a specific career transition or project you're hoping to complete in the near future. Then build in a little extra buffer. And if you don't get as far as you want, as quickly as you want, just remember not to beat yourself up too much because it's not unusual for things to take a little longer than you expect. If you're enjoying this show, I'd really appreciate you leaving a positive five-star review and rating for the show on Apple Podcasts. You can find a link that sends you directly to the review page at careerrelaunch.net slash 67, where you can also find a summary of today's discussion with Lola. Again, that's careerrelaunch.net slash 67. You can also email me anytime at joseph at careerrelaunch.net to share your thoughts on the show or just ask me a question you have about your career change. In our next episode of Career Relaunch, we're heading back here to London where we'll be wrapping up the final couple episodes of 2019. I'm going to speak with a museum producer who founded her own peanut butter brand. We're going to discuss the very high highs and the very low lows of starting her own food company, especially as someone with limited business experience from the past. Thanks so much for listening to Career Relaunch and a special thanks to Lola Scarborough for sharing her unique career story with us today from Texas. This episode was mixed by Richard Pennington. Electrocardiogram wrote and performed our original theme song. I'm Joseph Liu, and I'll see you next time.